everybody. I am uh, trying to find my lighter so I can join in and get in the mood as well. I don't think, uh, okay. You know what, I'll just light a candle in my heart. We're gonna take a second to read our Bible passage and uh, Ari will put that up on the screen for us. So this passage is from Matthew 3, uh, verses 1 through 12. In those days, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness of Judea, proclaiming, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is the one of whom the prophet Isaiah spoke when he said, The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his, make his path straight. Now John wore a clothing of camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then the people of Jerusalem and all Judea were going out to him in all the region along the Jordan, and they were, they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit worthy of repentance. Do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our ancestors, for I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now the axe is laying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and will gather his wheat into the granary. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. I'm going to invite you, actually, if you are willing to uh, do so, to turn your camera on so that we can sort of see you and I can see you and we can see each other and be a little bit more present in this space. Hey everybody, looking good. All right, so as Virginia talked about, um, we're kicking off the season of Advent for us and Advent is traditionally four weeks in the Christian calendar um, that come before Christmas. This is a time where people get, uh, are asked to get ready for the arrival of the Messiah of Christ. And one gets ready by usually focusing on uh, love, joy, uh, peace or hope in, in each of these four weeks. We've been observing Advent here at Root and Branch since the beginning, and many churches I know uh, these days do, but it's actually not super typical for some churches and denominations. It's a big deal, while others uh, may not even heard of Advent before. So the spectrum is pretty wide. I'm personally drawn to this season because like the season of Lent, uh, Advent is a, about time spent in the darkness. It's about time spent in the mud, uh, time spent sitting with ourselves, right? Taking an honest look at who we are, what we believe, what we want, and what we need. And it's not that Easter and Christmas are not great, but without first doing the work to understand why resurrection and incarnation are important, earth-shaking events, they risk becoming hollow cliches that uh, are more performative than they are actually transformative for us. The Messiah came for all, but not all had eyes to actually see. So Advent is a time for us to get our vision right. Like closing your eyes for a minute so that uh, they can become adjusted to the night and the darkness, Advent ought to help us activate the parts of our perception that let us see even the faintest oncoming of a presence in what otherwise would be total darkness. But what is it that comes? What is it that is coming in this darkness? What might we see when our eyes have been accustomed to the night that surrounds us? Another way of asking this, I think, is what is it that we hope for? Not just in the, ad, not just in the season of Advent, but in our lives, in this world, what is it that we hope for? I want to turn to the poem that you might have seen on our welcome screen, but in case not, let's put it up once again, Ari, if you can, and read it together. This is a poem by Emily Dickinson. 
it comes um, as an excerpt from one of her many series on life in general. So, hope is the thing with feathers. Hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul and sings the tune without the words and never stops at all. And sweetest in the gale is heard. A sore and sore must be the storm that could have bashed the little bird that kept so many warm. I've heard it in the chillest land and on the strangest sea. It never in extremity, it asks a crumb of me. I'm no Dickinson expert, but I, I read this somewhere. Dickinson does here what she does so well, uh, which is to give kind of shape and uh, physicality to emotions and feelings, right? And hope is this thing with feathers, this little bird that sings an unending song within us that provides warmth, comfort, even in the most extreme of circumstances. And yet, Dickinson says, it is a thing that never asks something of us, never a crumb, because it is just with us. It is just a part of us, this thing of hope. Hope is such a, a human condition. Perhaps animals have some similar feeling, but to me, it strikes me as a unique capacity of a creature who has knowledge of things like desire, time, and possibility. Human beings are hopeful animals. Some might say, uh, many have said many things throughout history about hope, and some have said it is a, a passion or a non-cognitive attitude. Others have argued that it does come from a rational brain and it is a willful decision that we make. Others describe it as the desire of a weak person, one who lacks understanding, is ill-prepared for the future, or as the existentialists, many of them French, said to us, hope is when someone simply cannot accept, uh, cannot face the brutal truths of human existence. Wishful thinking on one end, necessary virtue for the Christians on the other end, everything in between, whatever the interpretation is, hope is a part of our experience that I think we cannot deny. We may sometimes hear this word used as a kind of lofty thing, a religious word or a political one, the audacity of hope. And it becomes a little bit um, lifeless for us, right? We've heard it a little too many times. And yet, as Dickens reminds us, and I think reminds us importantly today, it is still something that sings in our soul at all times. Again, what is it that we hope for? What is it that we hope to see when we look out into the darkness? I'm not sure that this is an easy question for us to answer. In this darkness of the Advent season, uh, we look out, we're feeling that feeling we all feel as the sun sets on, on God, at an ungodly early hour and just as our day seems to be cresting. And there is a undeniable sort of melancholy that sets in in that moment. We look out into the desert of night. And what is it that we see? Is it something cute and warm and fuzzy that comes our way, right? A little baby Jesus asleep in the hay. I didn't mean for those to rhyme, but they do. Days of summer and sunshine and flowers and the lion playing peacefully with the lamb. Is that what we see? If our passage for today is any indication, the answer may not be so tranquil. John the Baptist says, look, blink those eyes, and here comes Christ with winnowing fork in his hand. He will clear the threshing floor. He will gather his wheat into the granary, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. A message for the cat as well. As someone who doesn't like scary movies, this is actually a very uh, harrowing image, right? It sort of reminds me of like being in a cornfield at night alone and you detect some shape moving towards you and you hope it might be the rescuing squad, but instead it's some crazy looking figure rushing towards you with a big pitchfork. Something, a, a circumstance I hope to never find myself in, right? And this image of God Coming with fire conjures up a lot of negative feelings for many of us, I think, for whom a, a wrathful God triggers memories of terrible sermons we've heard, 
cast upon us with the weight and burden of fear and shame as its anchor. I know that feeling very well, but uncomfortable as that might be, let us sit with this idea if we can, this image if we can, because I think we miss something extremely vital if we are so quick to throw out this image of God. The theologian and priest Rowan Williams once preached during this Advent season, Christmas is a beauty that is the beginning of a terror. The burning babe who has come to cast fire upon the earth. Before his presence, the idols fall and shatter. What an image, right? The burning babe. Unto us a child is born, how wonderful, who will bring fury and judgment upon this world. And though it may not seem like it at first, this is actually a hopeful image for many, right? And the symbols of religion and really all of humanity and its art and its literature, uh, its movies, a lot of sci-fi and fantasy, bear witness to this idea, right? Come, O Lord, judge the evil ones, overturn the systems that oppress us, bring kingdoms and empires and economic systems to their knees, raise up the oppressed, to bring peace to this land. Peace will come, I think, right? Yes, the lion will lay with the lamb beside the tranquil waters, but as many of us have shouted here in the streets of Chicago, especially this year, until there is justice, there is there can be no peace. And as those who have shouted this phrase throughout history also know the ones who ask for civility, for patience, for peace, ignore the violence that their peace brings, ignore the terror of the status quo, ignore the fact that there has never been peace for the brutalized and colonized and the enslaved, for the outcasts, for the outsider. The peace of the powerful is so often chaos for those without power. When John the Baptist sees such powerful people coming towards him, he yells at them, you brood of vipers, which I take to be quite the uh, pejorative, <laughs> mean thing back in those days, right? You brood of vipers, who warns you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit worthy of repentance. Do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our ancestors, for I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. In other words, there is no label or wealth or status to hide behind for these people. If they opened their eyes in the darkness, their eyes would grow wider still, I think, with terror. For this little baby has been born to come for them. What a different image of Christmas that is. While we preach God, a God of love and grace, this too is an image of God that cannot be ignored. And this God, I think, is made known to us. We know this God well in our own anger and uh, indignation right? that we feel so much these days. That we feel, we hear the cry of our murdered brothers and sisters. That we feel when we see the final moments of an isolated death in an overpacked hospital. No justice, no peace. This too is the voice of God. I ask once more, what is it that we hope for? Hope is fundamental, like I said, but of course we do not all hope for the same things. St. Augustine described hope as that which we believe uh, hope described it as believing in good things for the future. But what is the good that we would hope to see? Is it Trump's defeat or a vaccine or some return to quote unquote normal life? Is it more diversity in the workplace and places of power or for universal health care? These are I think all indeed good things that we might hope for, but the wisdom of our religious tradition tells us that no good of this world will ever be final. No good that relies on the power of human hands will remain pure. 
Can we not hope for something more than these things, man? a good that has the final word? There is a uh, Danish philosopher I like, one Soren Kierkegaard, who argues that hope in the temporal and worldly things is really just desire, and the only true hope is hope in the eternal, in God. Such hope, it overcomes the limits of our ordinary experience, an ordinary experience where we are continually disappointed. But it is when we are continually disappointed by this world, that is when we come to see the true hope of the eternal. And I am in this moment profoundly disappointed. Are you not? This year has been a lot of things, but I think uh, it has made at least one thing abundantly clear. Much of what we put our hope in, governments, leaders, systems, and the core decency of our fellow human beings has failed us. This has been a profoundly tragic truth that I hope we will never forget, but that too seems an unlikely thing as well. I read somewhere recently about how after the Spanish flu in 1918, that basically any mention of it was lost, right? And the many lessons of that pandemic were lost in time. Kids who were born shortly after the pandemic didn't even know it happened. People just didn't want to talk about it. We also know that something like the Black Lives um, Matter movement that crested so greatly this summer could have taken place a generation ago and the message would have been the same. And as I look forward, I don't see much in the way of change for what is being demanded for Black lives, even after some of the biggest protests we've seen in modern times. The Democratic Party lists social justice and racial equality on its platform, but puts forth actually nothing that would go in the way of changing any of these systems and things that are so wrong. Right? Every policy put forth these days to actually do something is not debated on the lines of its moral truth, but its political efficacy, its polling. When will these things end? Profoundly disappointed. In our religious tradition, we call these things um, that we put our faith in, that disappoint us, we call these things idols, right? Things erected in our image, things bounded by the limits of our own imaginations. And their profound di disappointment is a result of our propensity to see only a God we expect rather than uh, where we miss the God that actually comes. Again, that I quote, that quote I read earlier from Rowan Williams, the burning babe who has come to cast fire upon the earth before his presence, the idols fall and shatter. I'm sorry to be so uh, depressing here on this lovely or actually quite gray Advent morning, but I did warn you that my view of Advent uh, is that this is a bleak time. This is a time where we reckon with this stuff. But it is not for us to do so so that we are defeated, right? It's not that we do this to become fatalistic. We don't do this to lose hope. Quite the opposite. It is because we've been sitting in the darkness long enough to see. That's when our vision is made clear. It is then that we might know what we are hoping for. Burning with the flame of justice, here to set us free, to call those who do evil to account, to bring true peace on earth. This is a God worth hoping for as Christmas approaches. This Advent season, as we all stew in the darkness of both shorter days and a quite fucked up world around us, let us close our eyes and real contemplation and prayer and meditation, letting them adjust to the darkness so that when we open them again, we might see hope 
rising with feathers, singing in the gale, on the chillest land, on the strangest sea. Hope always with us. Amen.